Um, so we're really happy to have two of Canada's leading scholars on this issue of electoral reform and election law to talk about um, the legal dimensions of a possible shift in Canada from first past the post to either mixed member uh, representation or proportional representation. Um, as everybody knows, Justin Trudeau said during the uh, 2015 uh, campaign that that campaign would be or that election would be the last time that Canada um, was governed under a first past the post system. Since then, he has had a number of consultations and, of course, during the holiday season this year, put out the mydemocracy.ca poll. And I'll just read two of my favorite comments from Parliament on the poll um, from NDP MP Nathan Cullen. Mr. Speaker, watching the Liberals' electoral reform process is like watching that bus in Montreal slowly sliding down the icy hill, <laughs> mesmerizing disaster in slow motion. Uh, and Conservative MP Scott Reed said, based on people's responses, the website groups them as a guardian, a challenger, a cooperator, a fossil, or a snowflake. I found out I'm a unicorn. The shared values of unicorns include rainbows, sparkles, and ranked ballots. Uh, I'm a unicorn too. <laughs> Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our two panelists, uh, Professor, professor Michael Powell to my far right. He's a professor at the University of Ottawa. He was the co-editor of, uh, of a recent special edition of the Election Law Journal on electoral reform in various jurisdictions. Um, he studied law at the University of Toronto and, uh, and did his doctorate in law at and oh, sorry, his doctorate in law from the University of Toronto and LLM from NYU, um, and Professor Patrice Duchill, oh, sorry, um, who's a professor of politics and public affairs at Ryerson University and also is widely published on uh, the issues surrounding electoral reform, um, including uh, he was co editor of a recent edition of Essays from the Fraser Institute. Um, so thank you very much and welcome. It's a real honor for me to be here. And I want to thank uh, Howard Anglin for inviting me um, to address you on, on this very, very topical subject. It's fair to say that the, uh, the process of how to change our voting system has been as controversial as the various proposals that have been made to change the system. So process is, is as important as the actual substance of what people have proposed in terms of a new model for our electoral system. I want to talk more about the process, and uh, I, I have some arguments to make uh, about the, uh, the way it should go forward. While Canada's constitution does not have specific reference to what electoral system should be used to elect our, the members to the House of Commons, it does contain sections that have some application to the operations of the electoral system. Most experts say, suggest that the types of reform that have been bandied about would only require the assent of the Canadian Parliament. Most would only necessitate provincial support provided that certain requirements were met. Most would not, sorry, necessitate provincial support provided certain requirements were met. A few experts have argued that the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, decision uh, in the reference regarding Senate reform and a particular discussion, its particular discussion on constitutional architecture uh, in relation to the structure of government would include electoral reform, and I presume that uh, my colleague Michael will speak to that. The constitutional authority setting out the manner in which members are elected to the House of Commons uh, are, set, are found in sections 37, 40, 41, 51, 51A of the Constitution Act. Section 3 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, also provides for uh, the specific right to vote and stand for election to the House of Commons. Section 40 and 41 uh, are, start with until the Parliament of Canada otherwise provides. And that is taken to be uh, concrete evidence that the decision on our electoral system belongs to the Parliament of Canada and the Parliament of Canada alone. For many, this is straightforward. Any changes to the House of Commons can be made, be made by the authority of the Parliament of Canada. It's a matter of statutory change, not one of a constitutional nature. This is the view of the Prime Minister and of the government. While it has committed itself to consultations, it is fair, it has so far shied away from committing itself to putting the question to a referendum. The uh, special committee of the House of Commons uh, put out its report last month and one of the first recommendations it made was that in fact uh, the question, any question uh, on electoral reform should be put to the people of Canada. Uh, the government's reaction has been to 
let's be fair, uh, has been to dismiss that report. So until we hear uh, any more, we'll have to assume that it has also uh, rejected the idea of going to the people. The process of reforming the voting system, namely changing the first-past-the-post system, is not a new thing in Canada or to Westminster systems generally. What is important to note is that in each jurisdiction that undertook a formal process over the past 25 years, going back to 1992, the question of reform was put to the people, twice in British Columbia, twice in Prince Edward Island, and once in Ontario. The government of New Brunswick under Premier Bernard Lord has also, had also promised to uh, hold a referendum on the question, but it was defeated before one could be held. I'll discuss these, uh, the importance of these uh, experiences in, in the next few minutes. I'll also discuss Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Should the government decide to move on changes in the electoral system, I think a constitutional challenge could be mounted based on important precedents that have been set in Canada and in other Westminster systems over the past decades for the use of referenda to affect electoral reform. In large provinces and in small ones, in governments led by conservatives or liberals, the question was put to the people. For me, the record is clear. They have established an unavoidable constitutional convention, and I don't have to tell you in this audience that precedents and conventions matter. In British Columbia, the government led by Gordon Campbell included a commitment to electoral reform in its 2001 election campaign. In 2003, it created a citizens' assembly to examine the issue. At the same time it created that assembly, the government committed to holding a referendum two years, in two years in, in May of 2005. Premier Campbell said that we are giving the people, and I quote, that we are giving the people of British Columbia a direct say in how we should elect the MLAs that are sent, that are meant to serve them. After all, in a democracy, we should remember that we are here at the service and the pleasure of the people of this province. He continued by saying, there is no more fundamental tenet that we agree to as we seek office that in a democracy, the rules of the democracy should be designed by the people they serve, not by the power brokers who may wish that the democracy worked in their interests. It is by turning to the people and trusting the public that I believe we can reestablish the critical link between our democratic institutions and those they are supposed to serve. And he justified the need for a referendum by saying that the government wants to ensure that all British Columbians have the opportunity to vote before any change is adopted. We want to be sure that any change that is adopted is truly endorsed by the regions of the province and the people of the province. The British Columbia government went ahead, a referendum was held, the uh, proposition uh, was rejected, it came close. 58% uh, of the voters supported uh, a change to the system but it did not meet the threshold established by the government. The government nevertheless decided that a new referendum should be held and it, uh, it passed legislation in its next session in 2005 and uh, again a new referendum was held uh, in May 2009 and again the proposal for electoral reform was defeated and this time by a much greater uh, majority in the second question, in, this, in 2009, the government uh, proposed a question that actually gave two alternatives. Do you support the current system, the first past the post, or do you favor a second option? Prince Edward Island in 2005 and last fall in 2016 went to the people. Premier Binns, Premier Binns uh, decided to put the matter to the voters uh, of PEI in 2005. In mid-December of 2004, he said, we're providing time for Islanders to debate this subject, to look at our current model, first past the post, to compare that to mixed member system, which would have had some combination of first past the post plus a slate, and to have make a considered judgment on which is best and most appropriate model for PEI. The, uh, the, the Prince Edward Island speaker, Gregory Dingen, said, it stands to reason that we should have a strong vote in, voice in determining how these electoral systems work because we do have a significant bearing on the final results of an election. The PEI government went ahead, uh, a, P, uh, a referendum was held, the referendum question was defeated, the PEI government again went to the people last fall, uh, arguably uh, an alternative to the first past the post system was uh, was chosen in a complicated preferential, voted, uh, preferential vote system, but at the same time, less than a third of the electorate showed up, 
and the results of that uh, plebiscite uh, were held to be null. Ontario, in, 2000, in 2003, Premier McGuinty lobbied, uh, or, uh, had electoral reform uh, as part of his platform, uh, and he declared in 2004, when it, comes, uh, when it comes to how the people elect their representatives, the people of Ontario will have their say, he said. Uh, I've got a quote here on, on the board. Uh, the idea here was that and it, was, it was just no, no confusion. In terms of the government of Ontario, it was imperative that any decision, uh, any option that was created by a parliamentary committee or by a citizens' assembly, which was eventually uh, the model chosen, had to be put to the people. An electoral uh, a plebiscite, sorry, a referendum was held on the question in 2007 and the proposal was defeated with 30, about 37% of the people supporting uh, the proposal and 63% voting in favor of the existing electoral system. So in British Columbia, in PEI, in Ontario, whenever the, the uh, an electoral reform process was engendered, the commitment was made from the very beginning to hold a referendum. Ontario was not alone, neither was British Columbia nor PEI. In 2011, the, uh, the, the government of the, the United Kingdom, led by uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, also held a referendum. They had promised a referendum. And as you can see, the commitment was made from the very beginning that any question, any notion of electoral reform would be put to the people, simply because it belonged to the people. There is no constitutional provision for electoral reform, and it was considered that really the only way you could move forward with some legitimacy was to, uh, to appeal to the people and ask for their uh, affirmation of any proposal. The proposal in the UK, as you all know, was defeated and um, it's been largely abandoned since then. New Zealand had a vote, has had in fact three votes, in 1992, 1993, and again in 2008. The re first referendum was held in 1992, was technically non-binding and asked, for, asked two questions. And so there's an interesting uh, precedent set there. The first was whether the, past, the first past the post system should be replaced or retained. The second asked voters to choose between four, four, four systems. A second referendum was held in 1993, and this time it was binding. It asked voters to choose either the mixed member proportional system or the traditional first past the post. The majority supported uh, an alternative to the first past the post. 54% of voters supported the MMP. In 2008, they again were, uh, voters were again, because there's a lot of dissatisfaction in New Zealand uh, as to the uh, political impact of the uh, MMP, and the question again was put to the people. And as uh, Prime Minister John Key said, uh, we'll open our ears to New, Ze New Zealanders', New Zealanders uh, views on their uh, <coughs> on their electoral system. Finally, in Australia, Australia, which is often referred to as, uh, as uh, an exemplar of electoral reform, the last, uh, the last example of uh, constitutional review or debate on the electoral system was in 1992 in the Australian Capital Territory. Now, in the past, the, the Australian Parliament had made its own decisions on the electoral system, but in 1992, the Australian Capital Territory, the last one to examine uh, this issue, again, held a vote. And uh, it was an advisory poll. It was, uh, it was more of a, of, a, of a referendum, of a plebiscite. And people uh, chose the STV system. So my point is that you can have, you can put the question to the people and the people will make a decision. Sometimes they will support the first past the post system. Sometimes they will support an alternative. But the reality is that in every instance over the last 25 years, parliaments have had to consult the people. Why is this important? I've highlighted the motivations of all the government leaders. It's important because it addresses the, one of the issues that was raised by Sir Ivor Jennings and what is commonly known as the Jennings uh, test. This is important. As you all know, in 1981, the justices of the Supreme Court had to grapple with the, challenge of the gov uh, the, uh, with the challenges to the government of Canada's idea of patriating the Constitution and amending it. Three provinces had sought the opinions of their highest courts, but they were collectively split. So the question was referred to the Supreme Court. 
You'll remember the rationale articulated by the justices. It eventually came down to the opinion that Ottawa did have the right to act, but that it could only do so with a substantial, and this is a, a controversial question, a substantial measure of provincial support. It applied the Jennings test. It openly applied the Jennings test. The Jennings test. And the Jennings test has three questions. Were there precedents? Did the key actors in the precedents believe that they were bound by a rule? And finally, would there be a constitutional reason for the rule? To the Jennings question of what are the precedents, I've provided the record from Canada and abroad for the past 25 years. In all cases, governments turn to referenda to seek the approval of the people. The clear evidence is that over the past generation, both in Canada and abroad, electoral reforms have been put to the people. Governments, big and small, have felt compelled that by the idea that no changes to the electoral system could be implemented without the expressed consent of the majority, and sometimes a supermajority, both in BC and in Ontario and in PI, required 60% of the vote. The same thing happened in the UK, in New Zealand, and in Australia. To the Jennings question of, did the actors in the precedents believe that they were bound by a rule? I've given you a smattering of quotations from the leaders of the governments that specifically said that they had to go to the people because they felt bound by a rule. They felt bound by the need to consult with the people. They did not feel as though their parliaments could enact electoral reform without the legitimizing consultation of a people. And to the final question, would there be a constitutional reason for the rule? And I am I'm almost done. There is an argument to be made that Canada was founded, that the Parliament of Canada was founded on a balance between the Crown, the Senate, and the House of Commons. The argument would follow that a change to the House of Commons composition would affect the balance between the Senate and the House of Commons. The Senate was created to represent regions in order to compensate for any distortion in the House of Commons. If the House of Commons composition is changed, it would likely have an impact on the Senate. There's also another set of constitutional reasons, but they are more political and not juris, 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 legal. And they're not legal. <laughs> the, the, and this is about political culture. And there's a, a, a profound argument that could be made here about, and many have, many have done, made it, that a constitutional, uh, that a voting system will affect political behavior will affect political discourse, will affect what is at stake in the minds of voters when they vote. As such, one could argue that that could become a constitutional reason. But I, I much favor the first argument regarding the balance between the Senate and the House of Commons. The Canadian electoral system has functioned on a system of conventions, understandings based on precedence, a recognition that going to the people was imperative and that the issue was just as significant, if not more so, than other questions that have been put to the people. This reality was recognized by all the provinces that have made promises to their in their electoral platforms to, uh, to consider reforms on how Canadians could be represented in their legislative assemblies. In all cases, the governments considered it crucial to refer the question to the people. Why should it be different for the government of Canada? As Peter Hogg put it in his authoritative book, Constitutional Law in Canada, there is a stronger moral obligation to follow a convention than a usage, and that departure from convention may be criticized more severely than departure from usage. The government of Canada simply cannot assume that it can unilaterally change the way we vote. It has no exclusive claim to the electoral process, and it must respect conventions in my argument. The precedents set in Canada and in other Westminster systems over the past 20 years dictate that necessity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Howard for uh, inviting me and to Joanna for the kind introduction. Um, always a pleasure to be at Hart House. I was married uh, just one floor uh, down, still married. Um, so uh, always a pleasure to be back at, uh, at Hart House. Um, I'm going to speak today on the uh, uh, somewhat heated issue as far as uh, in academic terms of constitutional amendment and uh, electoral reform. Uh, the electoral system, the first past the post system in use, 
since 1867 is not written down in the Constitution. If we were drafting the Constitution of Canada today, we would probably want to put it in there as one of the uh, important features of the constitutional uh, order. But it is not, and that has caused a great deal of uncertainty uh, in terms of its constitutional status uh, and whether a constitutional amendment and potentially the consent of the provinces is needed to change the system because of two decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in the Senate reference and the Supreme Court of Canada Act reference. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about those two um, uh, cases today and then tie that in uh, to electoral reform. So uh, I don't actually have a very firm uh, conclusion to give you. I wish I did. Um, but I think it's important to point to the uh, uncertainty um, uh, about the constitutional amendment question. We've got a proposal from the committee uh, of the House. Uh, the nightmare scenario for me is someone who studies election law uh, and um, Good democracy has gone bad around the world, right? One of the disasters is a constitutional challenge to the legitimacy uh, of an election after the fact. Imagine an election uh, under a proportional representation system that then was challenged before the Supreme Court of Canada uh, uh, on constitutional amendment grounds. That's a, a nightmare scenario, uh, at least from uh, my point of view. So um, I'm going to talk about the big picture in terms of the constitutional amendment uh, uh, jurisprudence and then tie that in more specifically uh, to the uh, uh, electoral system. But the bottom line question is really, the um, Supreme Court of Canada has said the provinces must consent to some level uh, to change significant features of the Senate. Provinces must consent to some level to change the significant features of the Supreme Court of Canada. So why would the House be different? Right? If electoral reform will do some of those things that uh, its advocates uh, uh, believe it will. Okay, so uh, the big picture uh, uh, question uh, uh, on amendment, um, the two big cases are the Senate reference and the Supreme Court Act reference. The Senate reference uh, will be familiar to people in this room, I won't uh, belabor the details, but says um, the federal government, parliament cannot unilaterally uh, change aspects of the Senate, right? Or can you not unilaterally change anything to, that affects the constitutional architecture or the fundamental nature and role of the Senate? Okay, so whether those things are actually written in the constitutional text or not. So the court is very specific, even if something is not written in Part 5 of the Constitution Act 1982, which is where the amending formula is written down, even if it's not listed there as requiring provincial consent, it may require provincial consent to change. Okay. Um, some have argued that uh, reasoning of the Supreme Court should be read very narrowly to pertain exclusively to the Senate. Senate is its own particular beast. Uh, there's a long history of Senate reform. Uh, proposals, perhaps not actual reforms, but proposals. Um, one of the reasons not to view it narrowly, in my view, is because the Supreme Court Act reference takes uh, basically the same interpretive uh, approach. It says to change the essential features of the Supreme Court of Canada requires uh, provincial consent. So um, there is a list of documents, right, that form part of the Constitution of Canada Right, as part of the 1982 package of amendments, the Supreme Court of Canada Act, the act that puts in place the court, is not listed. Okay, so there was a lengthy debate among scholars, um, uh, Patrice mentioned Peter Hogg and many others over a few decades, um, debating whether the Supreme Court of Canada and the act was part of the Constitution or not, because it wasn't explicitly listed. The court says in that case, it is, and you need um, seven provinces or more, depending on the reform, to change important features uh, of the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, so what is the bottom line coming out of those two uh, cases? Uh, in my view, any important or essential or significant, whichever term you want to use, feature of a core federal institution okay, where the provinces may have an interest, um, potentially you may have to gather or, or uh, garner provincial consent in order uh, to change. So uh, a very uh, uh, relatively short list, but a number of entities that have been flagged by scholars as um, potentially uh, being part of the constitutional architecture or fundamental nature and role of a central institution. Uh, my colleague Adam Dodek has raised political parties. Right? There's a charter issue there with a uh, federal government trying to get rid of political parties. Are political parties uh, uh, so essential that they're constitutional? Uh, the Regional Veto Act, which some will remember, um, Richard Albert and Emmett McFarland, who's in the room, have raised questions about the constitutionality of that act. Uh, after those cases. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying the redistribution of seats 
Fair Representation Act that added 30 more seats to the House of Commons in 2011. Um, so I raised questions in an earlier article about what the Senate reference means for Parliament's unilateral ability to amend the Constitution to add more seats to the House. A disaster from my point of view if they can't, um, but that is one of the potential consequences of the court's jurisprudence. Um, the Chief Electoral Officer and other officers of Parliament um, the Convention of Regional Representation on the Supreme Court, right, not written down in the Constitution, that's by definition a convention, uh, was raised by the Nova Scotia trial lawyers in their case before the appointment of uh, Justice Rowe. Um, a bilingualism appoint, uh, requirement potentially for Supreme Court appointees. So all of these have been raised uh, as being put within a zone of constitutional uncertainty because of the two big decisions uh, uh, on amendment. And I would put uh, electoral reform of the plausible ones that are on the table, a mixed member system as recommended by the committee, or maybe even a single transferable vote system, which was uh, recommended provincially in British Columbia uh, uh, as uh, within the zone of uncertainty as well. So um, the court's approach has advantages, right? Uh, difficult to change um, certain features of federal institutions means illegitimate changes are discouraged, right? More consent is needed, that can be uh, a good thing. Um, the disadvantage, though, is a loss in flexibility. Okay? Uh, I'm a critic of the Senate as currently composed, nearly impossible now to change the Senate uh, in the ways, um, let's say, the previous uh, uh, government uh, had tried to do. So um, that's one of the disadvantages, I would say, is a loss in flexibility. Okay? So, um, so that's the big picture, I think, uh, uh, on amendment um, and uh, uh, something that's been in the news, but um, it's a great to have the opportunity to kind of go into it in a bit more detail here. What does that mean for the electoral system? Okay, so there are four possibilities um, for um, how the electoral system could change in a constitutional sense. Uh, Professor Denis Pilon has argued Section 40 of the Constitution Act 1867 gives Parliament the authority to do that, and I'll uh, rebut that argument. Um, my colleague Sébastien Grémont has a very interesting paper um, uh, that argues uh, Parliament has plenary authority, just as regular legislative authority gives it. Um, the power to change the electoral system. Uh, others have argued um, that Section 44 of the Constitution Act 1982, which says uh, Parliament can unilaterally amend the Constitution for some matters, right? That could be the source of authority. And I think prior to the amendment decisions would have been the most likely uh, uh, outcome. Or uh, provincial consent is required under the amending, uh, one of the amending formulas in Part 5. So I'll go through each of those. Um, and then talk about the systems in particular. So section 40, uh, Professor Pilon's argument, section 40 says, until Parliament of Canada otherwise provides, lists several provinces, um, uh, which shall be divided into electoral districts as follows. So until par the Parliament of Canada otherwise provides, um, Professor Pilon and Elizabeth May have argued means Parliament has the authority to change the electoral system because that was put in place in the original uh, 1867 document, okay? Um, that is um, not a convincing argument from my point of view um, because Section 40 and its counterparts are transitional provisions. They were there uh, um, when the, the document was put in place, the Constitution Act 1867. They were not intended to have any meeting beyond that. So uh, the Department of Justice has a nice little annotation, which they don't, right, there's controversy about how we interpret constitutional provisions, right? So Department of Justice does not very often on the Constitution Act listed on the Department of Justice website tell you what they think the provision means. Right? In this case, they say defunct, right? no longer a force uh, and effect. So, um, uh, and I think that's the right interpretation of the transitional provision in section uh, 40. Even if we were going to say section 40 still had meaning, um, the argument that it's the definitive provision ignores the Constitution Act 1982, right? that that had put in place an amending formula. Um, if we are going to take section 40 seriously as being a force and effect, then that also means, however, Right, that you have to look at section 41 that says if parliament doesn't legislate, the provincial electoral law is in place. So imagine, so parliament repeals part of the Canada Elections Act, so the Ontario Elections Act governs. That's simply not how we understand uh, uh, the procedure um, right now. So I don't find that um, uh, a convincing argument. That brings me to section 44, okay? Section 44 now has a pretty good literature on it because of the Senate reference, right? Senate, ref Senate reform was uh, attempted to be done through Section 44 primarily, um, but is really uh, used otherwise only to add more seats to the House of Commons periodically, 1985, and then in 2011, uh, uh, the House did that. So some have said, because Parliament can unilaterally amend the Constitution to add more seats to the House, it can therefore unilaterally amend the Constitution to change the electoral system to make it uh, uh, proportional. That may be the case, 
Um, but in the Senate reference, the court said Section 44 is uh, an exception and is limited. So uh, whether that, um, uh, that's not very encouraging, I don't think, for uh, uh, electoral reformers. Uh, and also, as someone who studies electoral boundaries, the provinces have always contested the federal government's unilateral ability to determine how many seats British Columbia has or New Brunswick has, right? And that's usually been resolved politically, um, but provinces have at various times threatened constitutional uh, challenges to that. And the Charlottetown Accord, for example, had a bargain that gave the provinces a say. So um, I don't think that is um, uh, uh, definitive. So. Um, it's possible that Parliament can change the electoral system on its own unilaterally through those various mechanisms, but the idea that provincial consent may be required uh, is certainly a realistic possibility from my point of view um, because it potentially engages the interests of the provinces, which is the test the court apl uh, applies in the amendment jurisprudence. Um, so I know I've only got a couple minutes left, so what does that mean for the particular systems uh, on offer? The committee recommended a mixed member system, which involves some representatives being selected from a list, okay? Um, Canada has at some small, in some small junctures, used multi-member ridings, okay? So multi-member ridings in a single transferable vote system, right? There's some at least tradition of that. We have never used lists before uh, federally. So under the court's test that any significant change uh, attracts maybe constitutional significance and potentially requires provincial consent, lists I think are very uh, suspect from that point of view. I don't know what percentage I would uh, put to that, but they're uh, an issue. And there's a ton of political science evidence looking at countries that have lists and saying list MPs and MPs elected directly from constituencies have different priorities. Okay. List MPs are much less likely to worry about the interests of constituents and much more likely to be involved in larger policy uh, uh, questions rather than fulfilling the kind of ombudsperson role that sometimes uh, MPs uh, uh, do. So lists are potentially an issue. Single member geographic writings, STV, it's not proposed by the committee, but it's one plausible uh, reform. Multi-member writings in that system. Uh, with a couple of exceptions, I said, we've had single member geographic writings. So that is a change that might potentially also affect the fundamental uh, nature uh, and role of the system. Um, not very many experts went in front of the committee and advocated the ranked ballot on its own. Um, the ranked ballot I don't think has any constitutional issues uh, with it at all because simply not a large enough, whatever its merits, it's not a large enough change uh, to implicate the formula that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, um, put in place in the Senate reference and the Supreme Court Act uh, reference. So. Um, Bottom line conclusion, I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty about the constitutional status of the electoral system and what the amendment jurisprudence means for a change to a more proportional system. Uh, the system proposed by the committee, the mixed member system, is the one that probably has, whatever the amount of risk is, that probably has the most, right, of the plausible alternatives because of the existence of uh, uh, lists. Um, if a mixed member system was to be put in place, just to get away from the amendment side, there's not a lot of charter uh, aspects, I don't think, to elect reform, um, but there is one that's very clear, right? In a mixed system, there's usually a cutoff, right? So if you get 0.2% of the vote, you don't get one seat, okay? There's a jurisprudence in many countries around the world about what the cutoff can be, right? If it's at the wrong number, right, it's too exclusionary, uh, and that runs into constitutional uh, democratic rights questions. So that might be one charter issue, section three uh, of the right to vote that might also uh, be in play. So thanks very much for uh, your time and I look forward to uh, your questions. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, so just a question for Michael. Uh, I note your point about um, in the Senate reference talking about changes to the constitutional architecture require um, buy-in by the provinces. I just wonder whether you can uh, take that and apply it wholesale to the issue of electoral reform and how that affects the House. The Senate exists to represent the regions and the provinces. Uh, the provinces have their own uh, electoral representatives in the legislature. Like, um, so why would provincial buy-in be needed for federal House changes? Uh, thank you, that's a, a very good um, uh, question. For, so for a few different reasons. Uh, the first, um, uh, I guess I'm guilty of taking the Supreme Court at their word in, in the Senate reference. So they could have ruled on much narrower grounds, uh, and instead they did not. They constructed a relatively elaborate theory of the architecture. Um, 
which would not have been necessary if all they were trying to do was to uh, speak specifically to the Senate. So I think there are larger things at play, and I could talk about the secession reference, which set out unwritten principles, and then we had a long debate, will the unwritten principles have constitutional weight and be justiciable? Um, and I think generally the answer was no. You might argue here they've actually given justiciable weight to the principle of federalism. And I think because the Supreme Court Act reference as well takes the same approach, mm -hmm. right, just to a different uh, important institution. So um, that's one, um, uh, um, uh, one point. Uh, the second is the House has never actually, um, I, I'm a big believer in representation by population. The House has never actually stuck in a strict sense to representation by population. So the provinces uh, have always been represented in some way as regional bodies, right, rather than strictly on the basis of their population. Um, no province can have fewer MPs than it has senators. That's one constitutional rule. Uh, no province uh, can have fewer MPs than it did in 1976, I think is the year. That's the uh, grandfather clause. Um, the formula itself that distributes seats to the provinces builds in uh, a kind of minimum, I won't go into the math, but builds into a kind of a minimum amount for each province. So um, we've never had strict rec by pop, so the House has always, in a sense, also been about representing regions. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but on the Supreme Court of Canada's test, that has actually, is something that carries some weight. I, I take your point. I guess I, I my response would be they were in both of those cases still looking at specific legislation um, you know so they did derive general principles but it was in the context of a sort of a more narrow investigation so I would uh, not necessarily assume that they having found that in one place would say that that applies to all forms of changes at the federal level but I, I, I take your points thank you Right, so what, one of the interesting things in the Senate reference, they don't talk about any of the other uses of Section 44 of the Constitution Act, which is what they're mainly ruling on. So they don't talk about electoral boundaries and other things. So it makes it a bit mysterious and harder, as you say, to draw conclusions. So I think that's a point in favor of your uh, position. There's a couple of organizations in the world that produce indices of, of freedom. So the Fraser Institute does the Index of Economic Freedom in the World, and then I think there's somebody called perhaps Freedom House that does Freedom in the World. Um, in all your studying of electoral systems, have you ever correlated the different electoral systems with the index, indices of freedom to see whether there's any difference? Do, do certain electoral systems produce higher ratings on the, on the freedom indices? Um. There is, yep, you can hear me. There is, there is a definite correlation between um, nations that have a high rating on the index and parliamentary democracies or just democratic systems. Mm. So inevitably, Western Europe, now Eastern Europe to a certain degree, the Scandinavian countries, North America, rank higher on the index and they are democracies. Uh, the Westminster system countries all rank very highly. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK. Aaron Lippiart, the, uh, the, the now American scholar, has made the claim that the best, the highest, the, the, the most progressive countries in the world have all moved away from a first-past-the-post system. So he sees the direct correlation there between an abandonment of the first past the post system and high rankings in terms of human development index or human freedom indexes. The problem with Lipyard is that most of the countries that have done that are all Scandinavian and as such all have a very particular political culture grown out of uh, a thousand years of civilization that is particular to them. So the, in terms of political science there's a real division in the camp. A lot of people think that Lipyard's uh, studies are, have, have been biased in favor of his favorite countries, namely the countries where he comes from. Uh, that's the best I can give you. I mean, uh, th there's no doubt that the more democratic the system, and first past the post is among those, uh, the higher the index of, um, of freedom is. Okay. Um, I, political, a lot of political scientists spend their careers writing about this. It's a matter of great, great debate. I mean, that might be one of the major ones in the whole. Uh, the Canadian debate ab uh, about this, I think, has been a little bit impoverished, right? The line that only certain systems are democratic or not. I think uh, I'm an agnostic in terms of the particular systems. They have their advantages and uh, 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 disadvantages. So, um, uh, 
but on the particular question, I think uh, it's it's a matter of great uh, great debate. I don't know what the conclusion I would draw that would be consensus. Thank you. Um, you know, I had the the great pleasure of uh, serving on the special committee on electoral reform, and of course, both of you were witnesses, and uh, so I, this gives me an opportunity to thank you again for the testimony that you each provided. Um, I think there's been a real poverty in the course of the debate in Canada over electoral reform, and this was reflected uh, by a parallel poverty in the amount of testimony we uh, sought out and found on the committee with regard to uh, constitutional issues relating to uh, some of the alternatives that are out there. I think in part this is because there was a culture in the debate that if you are looking at any concerns, you are automatically seeking to illegitimately derail the whole process, uh, which I can safely say is actually uh, certainly not been my motivation. Um, I can't speak for others. But, so here's, here's the thing. Um, with regard to uh, 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 your, your observation regarding the issue of um, uh, barriers to entry, you have to get X percent of the vote. Um, that's a very significant number in Canada. If you choose the wrong number, you would effectively have the effect of, it. for example, excluding the Green Party almost entirely, especially given the fact that uh, you are um, setting these uh, barriers to entry, two, three, four, five percent, whatever they are, by province. I don't think you can do one nationally without violating the Constitution. So, uh, but there's been no literature on this, and literally today was the first time I ever heard this intriguing question of whether or not there is a constitutional issue as opposed to a fairness issue involved. So that all of this is by way of leading up to asking you whether or not there has been any scholarship in Canada on it, or whether you intend, if there isn't, to correct that problem. <laughs> uh, there's been some, um, there has been some literature. There were, so there's a number of studies um, when the charter was the, the real uh, key issue, right? So is the current electoral system, first past the post, a violation of the right to vote, right? And I think that the, the recent court case in Quebec said it is, it is not. Um, and um, I don't think the charter argument is that strong, but there's some discussion of it in that literature of the people advocating that, that that's at least a potential uh, uh, issue, but um, not a huge amount since. But there is some comparative literature, right? Because in Germany there's been cases, in Turkey and a lot of other uh, countries. So would the number be 10%? Um, would it be 5%? Would it be 2.5%? So what's the number? And it gets into this debate about why, why is there a limit at all? There's a certain mathematical, right? You can only as assign so many seats, but there's also this idea of should extremist parties be uh, kept out? And is this a tool for doing that? That's been in the German debate. Um, so all those things uh, come into play. But I, I agree with you, there should be more, uh, especially if that's the system that is adopted, there needs to be a serious debate about what the number uh, should be and what the implications are. And just uh, before I uh, just uh, I had a, a second issue uh, that I'd like you to respond to as well as the first one if you wish. Um, one of the most common proposals is that we resolve the issue um, uh, of uh, disproportionality by adopting some new system which necessarily involves either a redistribution in order to create the top-up seats you're going to have or involves creating new seats for each province. And I've argued, but with relatively little interest from anybody else, that if you create top-up seats, you need to test their constitutionality to confirm that you are not violating the proportionality test that is written into, I think, Section 56, or maybe it's Section 52, I can't remember anymore, of the British North America Act 1867. Uh, as far as I know, there's been very little scholarship on this as well, but uh, again, can you draw our attention to anything that's out there, any considerations you have in this regard? I'm not aware of any uh, literature that has examined in depth the impl constitutional implications of the various proposals that are out there. Because, I mean, from, from a scholarly perspective, there's not a lot to be gained in, in examining something that is just, you know, floating out there. It's not actually real. The, in terms of the, the proportional, the, sorry, not the proportional, the, the single transferable vote or the, um, the idea of, uh, of creating a preferential vote, I think, does have the potential to raise another issue constitutionally, uh, which would offend, I think, the, uh, the Charter of Rights, which is that if you, if you adopt a preferential system, even though everybody has one ballot, the reality is that as you start eliminating um, candidates, their votes are redistributed. In effect, you are giving some people the right to vote twice. And potentially, you know, th th that becomes unfair 
the people who voted for the leading candidate voted once, but the people who voted for the, the, the candidate that came in second, third, or fourth get to have their, their, vo their vote counted twice, the first time and then a second time, in a second round. And I think that that would be the kind of issue that could be explored from a constitutional perspective. Yes, you had the chance to vote once, but your vote is being counted twice or three times or four times and counted differently. So I think that that opens, for me, the hornet's nest of issues, but that idea has not gone anywhere as far as I know, Scott, in Ottawa, I have to uh, underline that it has gone some distance here in Ontario in the sense that the provincial government passed a law this last summer, summer of 2016, that allows municipalities to adopt a preferential system for municipal elections. And uh, so far, as far as I know, f four municipalities have made a decision, all four have rejected uh, that notion, largely because of the argument I've just made. Um, I just a couple things on that. So there's a case from British Columbia um, uh, called the Campbell decision. Gordon Campbell was the mayor of Vancouver at the time. Uh, BC got shortchanged in the number of seats it got, which really meant uh, Vancouver's largest urban area got shortchanged. Uh, and so they brought a constitutional challenge saying that violated the proportional representation of the provinces. Uh, and the Court of Appeal says, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, Parliament has unilateral authority. Um, the question, but that's really the only Great case right on point. But the question is, is that still good law? Because in the Senate reference, the court says the default amendment procedure is 750. The Campbell case assumes, unless the proportional representation of the provinces is changed, which it defines in a certain way, the default is section 44, right? Which in the Senate reference, the Supreme Court says is limited and narrow and an exception. So uh, I'm not sure what to make of the contrast between the two um, uh, cases. The other issue is that say, so PEI is guaranteed four seats, okay? Um, does that mean any, as long as they have the, n the number four, um, that meets the obligation? Or is it four seats assigned in the way that we do, which is electing representatives from a riding rather than from a list, right? Because electing from a riding gives more local control potentially than, uh, say, a closed list, which I think is not what the committee recommended, but that is one thing that might be on the table rather than an open list of the local constituents. So there's no scholarship and there's no jurisprudence on that. Uh, at all, but another um, constitutional question that gets raised. Thank you both for a very interesting presentation. I have a very quick question for Mike and then a slightly more complicated question comment for Patrice. Um, I agree with you, Mike, that the any system involving a list with MMP being the most likely, um, most likely to occur will pose the greatest constitutional problems. Do you have any practical advice as to how to mitigate that corresponding risk. And to Patrice, um, putting aside the merits of a referendum aside, and to let my own bias, I think they are considerable, I am slightly concerned about drawing the implications of a constitutional convention between five instances in three provinces where the politicians said there would be particular consulting with the people if not a referendum and in light of our discussion last night about the risk of over-constitutionalization being a way of needlessly constraining legislatures, does that give you any pause on the issue of a constitutional convention that, as we know from the patriation reference, might not be enforceable by the court anyway? So thank you very much. So um, a quick answer, I would have open lists rather than closed because that gives more local control and I think that might fit within the idea that it's not as big a change to the House as a closed list, right? Closed list is con the party would pick who goes on the list rather than um, um, uh, voters or uh, local constituencies. Um, the other thing was I, I believe Scott raised is because uh, provinces are assigned seats, so you'd have to have, right, you, you'd have to have the system be designed in a way that it was tied to each province, so a provincial list Right, rather than a nat you could do a national list in theory, but I think that would have uh, constitutional uh, problems. So I think those are two practical ways to try to minimize the, the risk. Um, I would say five out of five is pretty important. Uh, <laughs> and 
I think that added to it is a dimension of the international experience. Um, I, I think what you've got there is the basis, of, in fact, of constitutional convention. I mean, I, I don't know what else you need. You've got different parties, different sizes of governments. You can't just say it's Western government or Eastern government. You have Central, East, and West. You have liberals. You have conservatives. There were no NDP at the time uh, who proposed this, interestingly enough. Interestingly enough, the NDP that has the most to gain from proportional representation has never uh, put forward uh, an electoral package, an electoral reform package. Uh, five out of five to me wins. And uh, I think that the, especially, and I, I'll add an, a political dimension to that, in a sense that in all five cases, the proposals were defeated. I see it as very problematic for the federal government to say, we are going to set aside five provincial decisions that rejected constitutional uh, electoral reform, and we're going to do it unilaterally. I mean, I think there's a moral dimension that emerges out of something like that. To simply say, we're just going to say, no, these five decisions, these five campaigns, these five efforts to think through an electoral reform uh, were rejected. We're going ahead and we're doing it anyway. I mean, it, it, for me, it becomes a moral issue. But you know, in terms of, 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 cons of jurisdiction, in terms of, 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 of juridical um, thinking, I think the precedents are set. I think it meets the Jennings test. Um, and I think it's a debate, ultimately, that will have to take place among the uh, justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. To, to follow up on what you just said, the five out of five question, uh, and maybe this is simple, but it's also very difficult to, to put your finger on the pulse of why people voted the way they did. I'm just curious why both of you would think all of those referendums failed, and, and what the reasons would be, or, or why people voted them down. Well, the short answer is that <clears throat> the arguments had no merits in Canada. Let me qualify. In New Zealand, the argument was bought. In, the, uh, in Australia, the last, in the 1992 uh, effort, the argument was bought, and people voted uh, for change. In all those cases, they were given very specific questions. Do you like this model, or do you like the current model? It was clear cut, the debates were held, people were unhappy, some, most people were happy. The election, uh, the decision was made, and the governments proceeded. In Canada, I think it becomes an issue of um, of, of campaigns poorly. Well, I mean, let's be blunt. I mean, campaigns were poorly mounted. Uh, the governments were not particularly uh, effective in defending their in, any, in defending any position. In fact, Premier Campbell said he would not take a position. Premier McGuinty was not to be found uh, on that issue. Um, even in PI, uh, Premier McLaughlin had a very low profile and has promised, by the way, I don't, can't remember if I actually said that, he's promised that there will be yet another question put to the Islanders next year or in two years' time. So it'll be round three for the Islanders. Which I think, again, confirms my, my argument that you cannot proceed on electoral reform without consulting the public. The precedent has been set and the rationale has been set. And I think that uh, people like, uh, like Michael Powell are actually making an argument uh, for the the, uh, the constitutional rules that underpin that rule. So um, there's more thinking to be done, but the answer to your question is a, is a political question, and it's also, uh, dare I say, um, a substantive question. I think that Canadians like their system, by and large. And it's not a small argument to make. The reality is that we've had, not just since 1867, since 1892, 225 years of experience with the first past the post system. We live in a very good country, not a, not a perfect country, but a very good country. And I think that the, the, the culture, the political culture that has grown around our first past the post system, a system of competition, a system of, uh, a culture of competition, a culture of compromise, has served this country very well. A country that is easily divided along regions, along ethnicities, along pretty well every potential uh, chasm possible. Uh, so I think that on a substantive basis, Canadians have been uh, favorable to, uh, to the status quo, and for good reason. Um, in the first BC referendum, there was a majority, right, that voted, just not a super majority. So uh, one of the things that um, matters, I think, are the rules and the design choices. So do you have the referendum on the election day? If you have it separate from election day, on a, right, turnout may be so low as it's not, it doesn't, isn't seen to be legitimate or, or it's below whatever threshold you set. If it's on election day, people may not pay attention because um, they're concentrating on the general election, which they think is more uh, important. Do you fund yes and no campaigns or not? 
uh, how much funding, uh, what are the rules of engagement. So all those kind of, are, do parties take a choice, right? People often filter their views through what the party they support um, sorts of parties aren't involved, which we may not want them to be because they have partisan interest, but then what does that leave you as a voter who doesn't want to spend weeks reading all this literature on electoral reform? Right, um, but I'm, I mean, I'm scared to make any uh, predictions about uh, referenda now after um, a Brexit. Right? Are they? Are, is it harder to win one? Is the default to, to vote against if you don't know? So I think that's a little bit uh, up in the air. But um, I think the design choices for sure make a difference. It's worth pointing out that in British Columbia, the second time around, the question was specific: Do you like this system or do you like the current system? And the current system won hands down. It came close. Sorry, it came close the first time around. Fifty-eight percent supported a proposal, but in 2009, when the question was asked, do you like the current system or do you like the, the alternative, people voted for the current system. 30% supported the alternative. So there's a huge difference between the first and second poll. So yes, the question matters, how it's, qu how it's posed matters, and the people campaigning around, around it matters, and the circumstances matter. People have argued uh, in political science that uh, the second time around, uh, in 2009, the Campbell government was very popular and people saw no need to change the system. The first time around, people were upset with the system and were more likely to vote uh, against it. So politics matters. Yeah, and, and for as someone from British Columbia, my recollection of the second one too is I think some people were just annoyed at being asked the same question twice. <laughs> but it wasn't the same question. It wasn't. Yeah, it was different. But it's a different question. <laughs> it's a, but to but have it was the same nuisance, yes, but it's the same, but it's a different question. Uh, I'm originally from New Zealand and I studied electoral systems, so this is perfect for me. Welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, first off, I think there's a clear moral argument to have a referendum because people should get a choice. And I think there's a clear political argument to have a referendum because I think it will be politically popular. So I think uh, there should be a referendum. And I think the New Zealand context suggests that a two-stage referendum is very important. People often aren't confident voting to change the system until they know what the proposed alternative is. Uh, we did the same with our recent flag referendum. We had a runoff of four uh, options to change the flag. People picked a favorite proposed alternative, and then there was a second vote between the proposed alternative and, and the current flag, which narrowly failed. Are you happy with the result? Uh, <laughs> offline. Um, <laughs> um, but I think the problem with getting this into the Constitution is that there's such a wide variety of potential changes to uh, an electoral system mm. that where do you draw the line between this is a minor tweak and so is fine, or this is a major change and so we need a referendum? And uh, in the absence of an existing line, the clearest option seems to be what the Constitution requires, which is what the Constitution lists as the, the key factors being, are currently. And, and, and then if you're proposing something more minor than that, then maybe not. This is not to say there is no moral or political obligation, but as far as the law goes, I think that's where the, the line should be. Um, a, a final, so, so thoughts on that, and then a final quick note is on the preferential voting system and the idea that some votes count more than once. I, I don't think that's correct. If you think about it like this, each round of voting, every vote counts. It's just that the people who voted for the leading candidate, their vote is cast for the same person the second time. So every, vote, every person's vote is still counting, counted multiple times. It's just that theirs doesn't shift to a different person the second time. So I think that deals with that, that particular issue. But if, well, yeah, we can have a very, very good debate on that one. But if you voted for A on your ballot, and B was your second choice, and C was your third choice, candidate A was defeated, so your vote for B then counts. So you voted for A, and then you voted for B, but and then you vote for C. So you are technically voting three times for three different people. But the other people And that's not all. fair, because the other one just voted once. Well, no, but they didn't vote once. They voted three times just for the but same person each static. time. It yeah. stays static. It stays static. It's the same as if you had a runoff election, say, in the French presidential election. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't say that people who voted for the leader and then voted again for the leader. Fundamentally different, but it's fundamentally different. You have a, you, you have a, yeah. you have a blank slate at we, that point. We can take that offline. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be yeah. fun. <laughs> it's, it's an interest. It's a very, it's a very interesting argument. It could even come down to technicalities about how the computers count it. Do the count, computers just recount the votes that are no longer mm -hmm. valid, or do you recount all of the mm -hmm. votes? In which mm -hmm. case, they're counting. But anyway, mm -hmm. thanks.